What is philosophy? How did we come about it? And why do we need it? And what has happened to philosophy today? And what's the future of philosophy? Today I'll answer all these questions as I discuss the rise and fall of human philosophy. We humans utilize three massive weapons to navigate the world around us. And they're all built in inside us. As a result, we humans are the most sophisticated animal that has ever lived on Earth, which is incredible. Next time someone complains about the world being unfair, remind them of these amazing tools that every human has, while other animals don't have all of them. What are they? Like all animals, the first and most important tool is instinct, which most of the time subconsciously shapes our behavior. We have three basic instincts, food, sex, company. Our first and most important instinct is survival. We spend a minimum of eight hours or one third of a day working to earn bread. Imagine we didn't have this instinct. How would you motivate yourself to work? Or worse still, how would you motivate others to work? Our survival instinct goes beyond food. We instinctively avoid danger and anything that threatens our life. Do you think what happened to creatures who didn't have survival instinct? They needed a self-help book to motivate themselves. After working 8 hours in the evenings, we spend hours prowling our city center bars and restaurants in search of a mate or courting a mate. This is the instinct to procreate. Of course, nowadays we chase a mate for our recreational purposes. The sexual urge is so strongly wired in us, especially men, that, that we do it despite the fact that most of us have no plan to have children. The giant panda is going extinct because they have become too lethargic to have sex. So the Chinese government spends lots of money to make more pandas. Imagine our ancestors didn't want to procreate. We wouldn't be here. Our third most basic instinct is seeking the company of other humans. While men have a stronger sexual urge, women have a stronger urge for company. Without this instinct, we would all end up alone and perhaps would never have a civilization. Basically, our instincts tell us what to do most of the time. So we don't have to really think about it or twist our brain to motivate ourselves to do these things. We instinctively seek food, a partner, and the company of other people, which allow our conscious brain to save energy on something else. The second weapon in how we navigate life is our emotions which fluctuates day to day and allows us to understand ourselves and those around us. Our emotions give us hints about our environment. Depending on the time and place, we feel angry, sad, frightened, content, happy and ecstatic. If instincts are like climate that remains stable long term, our emotions are like weather that regulates our daily life. Our instinctive urges push us to do things to achieve what we want. But our environment says yes or no. For example, seeking a partner, we want someone, but that person wants someone else. Here comes our emotions to allow us cope with this failure. Or worse still, our survival is threatened. Our emotions allow us to cope. So emotions allow us to grow, change and adapt to a new place or person somewhat quickly. Our emotions are incredibly powerful in motivating us to do things right away. Negative or positive emotions help us grow and move on and seek a better environment. In fact, one of the reasons humans conquered the world is because we are not happy where we are for a long time. Apart from seeking food and safety, we are also motivated by boredom. So our emotions give our conscious mind more free time to do other things. Instead, our emotions do the job for us at motivating us to move, grow and change. Our third and perhaps the most sophisticated weapon we have is reason, which is the basis of science and technology which allows civilizations to flourish. This makes us different from other animals, our ability to make rational decisions based on informed knowledge and calculated risk. Instinct and emotions are hardwired in us from birth, but rationality is mostly learned through direct experience of our own, as well as knowledge passed on from our parents and ancestors, either orally or in writing. In fact, our rationality is so powerful that it can regulate our instinct and emotions. For example, our ability to delay gratification allows us to forego our present pleasure for future and long-term pleasure. Of course, not all humans are born equal when it comes to delayed gratification. Some want their cake right away, some can wait a bit longer. 
but rationality is an incredible tool for us to look long term, not just here and now. Today we live in a modern world or in the age of rationality. All our modern technological conveniences are the result of rational science. To sum up, humans are hardwired with three incredible tools, instincts, emotions and reason. But where does philosophy fit in this? The word philosophy in Greek means the love of wisdom. So the first true human science was philosophy. In fact, philosophers were the first Russian thinkers who replaced the wise old men or women. They were career thinkers, meaning they were known for their thoughts and wisdoms. So philosophy at its core is a structure of rational thinking. In other words, its foundation is rationality. Why? We humans developed a more sophisticated brain. Perhaps the discovery of fire allowed us to cook our food so we could digest our food much quicker. As a result, we had more time to think. When you're busy, you have no time to think. In fact, I do my thinking while in the toilet because I don't have my smartphone with me. But this brain, good in many ways, also came with a disadvantage. It allows us to develop acute consciousness or self-awareness. The more we understand our environment and our own existence, the more we start to brood and ask difficult questions. One reason today we control our brain by keeping ourselves busy or hooked on something, like work or entertainment or smartphone. But with this thinking brain came the most devastating awareness of all, death. Other animals might know death when it comes to them, so they instinctively avoid danger. But we human beasts know death from an early age. As rational animals, we learn from the past to anticipate the future. In other words, we anticipate death. Despite trying not to think about it, we have this fear in the back of our mind. So this brain of ours became powerful enough to ask important questions. Why are we here? What is reality and how we know it? Early humans couldn't explain the world, life, the things around them, especially the sun, the light, seasons, thunder, fire, etc. But the most important question was why death? This is the main theme of the oldest surviving human story, the Epic of Gilgamesh, written three or four thousand years ago in which the hero is seeking immortality. But unfortunately, he fails. So to console himself, he builds a city so people could remember him. Other humans invented gods and religions as security blankets. In fact, the fear of death is so strong in humans that nearly every religion has extended life to afterlife. So death couldn't scare us anymore. You could say that human life is so short that we have to have an afterlife. However, today most people don't believe in afterlife. Politically or practically, early human societies were ruled by the strongest among them, or a group of strong men. Then, through the passage of time, generations later, myths, legends and stories about these strong people were created. As time passed, these legends and myths gave these early strong people titanic godlike roles. As Italo Calvino once said, folk tales are told and retold so many times that they become like pebbles. Smooth, shiny and perfect. Of course, the earliest gods were usually non-human phenomena such as the sun, thunder, light, dark, earth and so forth. But over time they took a semi-human form. Later these ideas became more sophisticated in the form of religion that told sophisticated stories about the origin of life and also explained death through afterlife, resurrection or reincarnation. But philosophers tried to explain without relying on gods and the supernatural. So they used reason to ask two important questions, which became the two main pillars of philosophy. One, what's really out there? And two, how we know it. So ontology asks what's reality and what things exist or don't exist. And epistemology asks how we know the world. So philosophy became a rational tool for humans to understand the world, the meaning of life and how to navigate the world correctly. So early philosophers studied all sciences, from stars to frogs and everything in between. But if you boiled it down, the three main subjects for philosophers were the physical world, the origin of life, and the human mind. In other words, what is the world and how does it work? What is life and how it works? And what is human mind and how does it work? So remember, these three main topics also play philosophy's own downfall. As time passed, philosophy became too big and too sophisticated, so it gave birth to other disciplines. In 15th and 16th century Europe, the first baby was born. 
For example, Galileo, Copernicus and Newton were the pioneers of physics, so physicists took over the job of studying the world, the universe, stars, planets and matter as a whole. A big load was off the philosopher's shoulders and now they focus more on metaphysics i.e. the meaning of life and the property of the human mind. Then in the 18th and 19th century, however, another baby was born. Biology took over the job of studying life. Philosophers no longer needed to dissect frogs or understand the human body. An important biologist was Charles Darwin, whose theory of evolution by natural selection revolutionized everything we know about life and its origin. So philosophers were left only to focus on the human mind. But unfortunately, they would snatch that away from philosophers too. In the late 19th century and early 20th century, philosophy gave birth to its last baby. We call it psychology that took over the job of studying the human mind. Two big names are Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung, who both placed importance on the subconscious, the unconscious mind, as greater motivation in human behavior. So philosophers didn't have to diagnose the human mind anymore. Phew, for centuries, philosophers were doing the jobs of four people, a physicist, a biologist, a psychologist, and a philosopher. Now they could enjoy a bit more free time and just sit in their comfy chairs and be philosophers. After all, everyone has to retire at some point. But retirement is a tough period in anyone's life. Without things to do, you either face an existential crisis or become lazy and rot away. So today philosophers have become a bit lazy on the whole, but also they are a bit out of touch because physics, biology and psychology have become too specialized. So philosophers don't have the time to rigorously study all three disciplines. Also they don't want to get their hands dirty dissecting frogs or spending hours staring at a telescope to study the stars or spend time with mentally ill patients. So the big question is, what is the purpose of philosophy today? Should it unify physics, biology and psychology once again? Or should it find a new path for itself? Friedrich Nietzsche, the first to fully diagnose the problem of Western philosophy, took philosophy back to the cave through his Zarathustra, who instead of prophesizing for a single god and the divine tell us about the new type of human, Ubermensch, who instead of following social values, create new ones through their artistic and philosophical works. Like the early humans who went to the cave to gain wisdom. Nietzsche criticized philosophy for being too rational, not passionate enough. Philosophy is an old man who has produced many amazing kids and now feels lost for a purpose. Why? It's very simple. It lacks passion. Philosophy started as a rational tool, but it was also its downfall. As we saw, science like physics, biology took over the rational side of philosophy and psychology took over the irrational side of philosophy. To put it very crudely, what is left? Not much. Is philosophy completely doomed? Well, not quite. I have an answer. Earlier I mentioned the three big human weapons, instincts, emotions and reason. Biology and psychology are taking care of the instinct and the unconscious. Literature takes care of the human emotions through storytelling. And science takes care of reason. So is philosophy without a chair now? Not quite. My solution is human intuition. There you go. A new philosophy should be based on human intuition. What is intuition? In a nutshell, instincts are mostly unconscious. Reason is mostly conscious. And emotions are somewhere in the middle. Where does intuition fit in? It is somewhere between instinct, the hard rock foundation, and reason, the hard rock roof over your head. So intuition is fluid between two solid surfaces and also right next to emotions, which is very volatile and even more fluid. Intuition is a layer deeper than rationality and a level above instinct. So the new philosophy should be based on intuition because it has direct access to instinct, but also reason. So in a way, it fits right between the unconscious psychology and the, the conscious rational sciences like physics and biology. Scientists don't utilize intuition, so it's a perfect tool for philosophy to understand and explain the world. Why intuition? An intuition-based philosophy can equip us with a better weapon to cope with suffering. Rationality through sciences provides us with security, physical utility and comfort through medicine and technology, like a traditional father would. Science builds your house, produces your food and clothes. Emotions provide you with love and care like a traditional mother would, which is literature and stories. 
Intuition provides you with the ability to have insights, original ideas, inventiveness, and the ability to connect dots so you have a goal or mission in your life or relevance in society. Intuition is fast, snappy, and in-the-moment insight or genius that allows societies move forward. In fact, most inventions and discoveries can be attributed to intuition, not rational thinking. Reason is slow, instinct is too rigid, and emotions cloud your judgment in the moment. But intuition is hit and miss. When it hits, it sparks a new light. So, is there a philosopher who bases his philosophy on intuition? I'm glad you asked. Yes, there is. Henri Bergson, a French philosopher, argued that intuition can vitalize life and give us a new spark. As Nietzsche argued, reason-based philosophy has become too stale. For Bergson, intuition is the closest thing to a direct experience of something. For example, if you want to know a city, you can read all the maps and photographs of the buildings, but it cannot be as good as if you walk the streets of that city. For example, you can never fully convey the taste of an apple to someone who has never eaten an apple. That intuitive experience is the closest we human get to experiencing the, the taste of an apple. So intuition takes us back to our nature, while reason is moving us away from nature. Of course, Bergson is famous for his philosophy of time, creativity, and humor. He thought intuition and life go together. We know reason tries to tame our natural instincts and emotions. Rightly so, but it can also go too far in taming us into a docile animal with no vitality. Bergson's philosophy is called vitalism because he wanted to liberate us from the chain of reason. So philosophy started as a rational tool to understand the world, life, and the human mind. Then it gave away those roles to physicists, biologists, and psychologists. Now it's almost become redundant, so we need a new intuitive philosophy. But to really understand philosophy and where it stands today, we need to know the history of philosophy, its various schools, approaches, Eastern, Western, humanists, animalists, rationalists, empiricists, social philosophy versus individual philosophy. So in the following episodes, I'll go through human philosophy to give you an overview of the entire 2500 years of human philosophy. Next, I'll explain some of the common philosophical terms like what is the difference between ontology and epistemology, physics and metaphysics, rationalism versus empiricism, humanism versus utilitarianism, existentialism versus postmodernism and more. Stay tuned. Thank you for watching.